let's get started. Uh, so today's lecture will build on what we talked about yesterday. So yesterday was mostly a more generally uh, computational methods and in particular uh, molecular dynamics. Today is more uh, uh, directed towards some of the theory that we use to either interpret the, the results that we have from simulations or basically by the simulations and then also general concepts uh, of how to apply it to you know, sort of study uh, mechanics of protein materials, which is primarily what, uh, what is going to be the focus of the next uh, three, four lectures, uh, so mechanics of protein materials. And uh, so when we say proteins, uh, most people think about, uh, at least uh, if you don't work in this specific area, at least I can think of a nice piece of steak uh, uh, which is, is rich in proteins. Uh, but uh, there is uh, really a lot of uh, interest in looking at organic matter, and this includes proteins and DNA and lipids as well for the technological applications. Uh, one of the things that you can think about is uh, why would you want to do this and what's the uh, benefit of these organic materials and uh, you know, this is a scene from a movie called uh, I think The Man Who Wasn't There and uh, the guy is, uh, is a barber and he's thinking about uh, hair and he's, uh, he's heard from somebody that hair keeps growing even uh, after you die for a little bit and uh, uh, that he wonders what makes a hair uh, keep growing even, even when you lose your life and uh, uh, what is it made of and uh, is it uh, something that we can recreate uh, in our own labs and uh, this kind of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in that kind of area uh, where we use uh, organic polymers to create uh, materials that either uh, exist in nature or uh, surpass uh, nature <coughs> systems. And uh, there's many examples, uh, even uh, if you look at cellulose and lignin and uh, what makes wood or what makes paper. Uh, these are all organic materials. Uh, one of the really nice things about organics is that uh, they are typically renewable materials, so you can uh, uh, create them more, almost indefinitely, and uh, uh, they have deg degradation, functional degradation, uh, so you can control the degradation properties uh, such that uh, it doesn't exist in nature for uh, eternity. And then uh, you, you, they can also use them for structural materials, so that, uh, such as wood uh, is, is very widely used as a structural material. Uh, what most people know less about is uh, some of the more recent uh, nanotechnological uh, uh, advancements that, that has been made uh, with regards to organic materials. So uh, here I gave uh, three examples, but there is uh, plenty more. Uh, what is uh, the uses in uh, biotechnology, so use of proteins or protein-like materials uh, in, in uh, uh, tissue scaffolds? These are uh, materials that we use for tissue regeneration. So one application is when, when you have a very big uh, a burn or, a, or an injury, uh, the body tries to recover. It doesn't want to lose uh, uh, water and so forth. So to recover very fast, we, uh, we have a scar tissue formation. The issue with scar tissue formation is that it's not uh, functional, as functional as regular tissue. So you lose a lot of uh, functionality such as movement or uh, other properties of the skin, for instance. And uh, one way to alleviate that problem is uh, to reduce the uh, formation of scar tissue, uh, not only from functional but also aesthetics uh, perspective. And uh, uh, what is typically used is materials like silk or uh, uh, collagen-based materials uh, that are used for uh, tissue regeneration. So the cells can adhere to these materials and then uh, basically reproduce themselves and reproduce uh, later on the tissue uh, without uh, the risk of losing too much uh, water and so forth, dehydration. Uh, so this is one application uh, from a biotechnology perspective. Similar materials are also used now for drug delivery, like lipid-like materials that uh, enter the cells and then deliver the drug and then uh, disappear uh, are uh, uh, widely used now for, as, a, as a concept towards uh, uh, treatment for cancer and other types of uh, uh, diseases. So uh, these are some of the uh, more recent applications uh, which are very closely connected to biological systems. Uh, there are other applications where it's, uh, it's completely unrelated to biological functions. Uh, one is a uh, uh, use of organic materials in electronics uh, and also renewable energy and infrastructure. And uh, these are very recent developments. So for instance, the use of organic LEDs, organic polymer-based materials uh, for screens, or the uh, use of organic photovoltaics for uh, the generation of energy from the sun. Uh, it is relevant to uh, biological systems in the sense that we also have photosynthesis, which is a very interesting a way of generating energy or storing energy, so there's a lot of ideas that come from biology in that regard. 
The issues with organics is that uh, in many cases they are very fragile, so uh, they are sensitive to moisture, they are sensitive to UV radiation, uh, but they are also uh, mechanically in many cases not very strong. So uh, even though they have a lot of, uh, they are easy to manufacture, uh, there is a cost associated with them due to these uh, fragility aspects. So, what we want to do uh, in general is uh, develop fundamental models that explain the structure of these materials, how they come together when they self-assemble, uh, which is a key mechanism through which we synthesize uh, a lot of these materials, and then the mechanical properties, the thermal stability, degradation, and so forth. And many of these uh, mechanisms are, are really at the molecular scale, so this is why we look at these uh, at a small scale. Um, so I mentioned that uh, organic materials are typically uh, uh, very fragile. The question is, can, can you make something strong out of a biological polymer or a biological material? And there has been a lot of research and debate uh, as to what kind of materials could be suitable uh, for uh, 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 applications such as roof vests and so forth. And uh, spider silk uh, has emerged as a, as a material that is, uh, uh, that is found to be strong and very tough. Uh, it could even say that it's stronger and tougher than structural steel or certain kinds of steel. Uh, the question is, uh, and, and some people even have uh, hypothesized that you could st uh, stop at Boeing 747 that uh, is in flight uh, by using a, 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 a strand of uh, silk that is this uh, thick, uh, which seems very exciting, but if you do the calculation, uh, it turns out that you need tons of silk and kilometers long strands and so forth, and uh, there's no way to make that much silk. Uh, the issue here is if you try to uh, create spider silk, just like you create regular silk, uh, basically farms kind of uh, 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 from the insects. Uh, spiders tend to eat, eat each other, they're carnivores, so you don't get any spiders left in the end, and you don't get uh, any uh, spider soup made up of it uh, other than a few grams. So this is one of the major challenges technologically as to how you would mass produce these materials. Uh, in fact, the only material that has been made out of spider silk so far is uh, this uh, very rare textile uh, in the American Museum of Natural History, uh, which took uh, thousands of spiders and also uh, several workers uh, working for four years nonstop. So uh, it's, it's a very far fetched idea. Uh, it's basically applying spider silk directly to anything uh, that we can use functionally in, in real life. Uh, so the key idea here is basically uh, you could study spider silk and understand what makes it strong and what makes it superior to a lot of man-made materials, and then look at uh, synthetic systems based on organic polymers that uh, uh, either uh, replicate or surpass the properties of spider silk that we're interested in. So this is sort of uh, the motivation towards why we study mechanics of these materials. And then there's other applications uh, where we look at uh, uh, mechanics of proteins at the nanoscale or at the molecular scale. Uh, you might ask, uh, why can't we look at these at, at the continuous scale and uh, uh, basically smear out all of these details about molecules, which uh, probably doesn't interest us when we look at it uh, from the microscopic scale. Uh, well, you could do that, and there's many ways to, to do it, or at least uh, get approximate uh, relations. But then a lot of interesting things do happen at, at these small scales, and they really govern the overall macroscopic behavior. So one material we could look at is, uh, is very important for tissue injury and repair. Uh, this is called uh, fibrin. It's, uh, it's uh, what basically constitutes the, the blood clot. And uh, it's a very stretchy material. As you can see from this uh, uh, short movie, uh, it can really stretch it to several hundred percent strain. Uh, the key idea here is that uh, if you look at fibrin, there's a, a hierarch hierarchies of different uh, mechanisms that play a role. So you have a network of uh, polymeric materials. As you stretch the network, it reorients and uh, basically you have a geometric laminarity, which uh, continuum theory is typically not a, a way of uh, covering. And then uh, you also have a lot of uh, molecular mechanisms that occur, sliding of molecules or unfolding of molecules. Uh, all of these happen at the nanoscale and are very dependent on the specific structures we're looking at. So uh, this is why we look at the molecular unfolding mechanisms proteins, uh, because this gives us very good uh, information as to how to model these materials at large and large scales in the context of uh, what we call multi-scale modeling. Okay. So in order to get into these molecular details, we really need to understand how these materials are created in the first place, uh, at least to some extent. 
and I'm not a, I'm a, I'm not a by, by a, a training, I'm not a biologist or a, you know, a chemist, but uh, I try to understand this as much as I can, and I will try to explain it in the simplest terms uh, I can. Uh, so basically, uh, this is the basis of uh, protein synthesis. You have basically a, a DNA code that gives you a sequence of proteins, a sequence of amino acids, which constitutes the linear one-dimensional structure of a peptide. This is what we call a polypeptide. So this is a, essentially a chain of amino acids that, uh, uh, through dehydration synthesis, uh, create peptide bonds, and then by adding more and more monomers, you can create a very long chain. Um, and that this chain, through some uh, other interactions, such as hydrogen bonds or hydrophobicity, collapses onto a very complicated uh, three-dimensional <coughs> structure. Uh, and then this is a sort of the transition from here to there is, is one that we can study, such as the folding problem. And then also the uh, unfolding, which is the other way, uh, is another problem we can study from the chemical perspective. Uh, if you look at the chemical structure, it's actually not that complicated uh, for, uh, for proteins. Uh, you have basically what we call an amino group, which is a, a nitrogen with some hydrogen, and then a carboxyl group, uh, which is a double bonded oxygen, a carbon, and then a hydroxyl group as well. So, and then, uh, these are basically universal. This amino group and the carboxyl group is what we call the backbone of a protein. It's the same in, in most uh, amino acids. Uh, but this one, uh, the side chain, is really what gives the chemical specificity of the uh, 20 amino acids that create uh, uh, all of the protein materials, uh, almost all of the protein materials that we know. Uh, so that's really interesting in the sense that you have only 20 building blocks, but it gives uh, uh, basically all that diversity of materials uh, that are made up of proteins. Uh, and uh, these are essentially the, the 20 amino acids uh, found in a linear chain. And I, this is uh, sort of typically how we represent them at the molecular scale, by using color coded uh, ball and stick diagrams, where each color represents it. Uh, okay, so we talked a little bit about these uh, weak molecular interactions that cause the folding process. Uh, one of the key interactions that, uh, that we, I will talk more about today is hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are very important because uh, they govern the stability and architecture of proteins at, 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 at the molecular scale and up. So it's, uh, it's almost like a, what I would call like a molecular group in that sense. So the way a brick and mortar structure works in macroscopic scale, the same kind of uh, uh, hierarchies and structures can be formed at the smaller scales through hydrogen bonds. Okay, so the, the, this is basically most evident, I think, from a, a folding kind of a simulation or a study, uh, where you can see that uh, once you form these hydrogen bonds, the domain becomes uh, fairly stable. So it's still vibrating and fluctuating in the temperature, but uh, uh, they, they have an effect which uh, really stabilizes this local structure uh, that is created. So this, I think, is a, one of the important concepts of protein, protein materials. Uh, and then, this is only looking at it at a single molecule level, but a lot of protein materials are actually hierarchical. So what I mean by that is the following. You start from the molecular scale, which is in the order of angstrom. Uh, you have these hydrogen ones and other things. Then it falls into another kind of a, a structural uh, uh, system, like a, a, a tertiary structure. Then you can create fibrous materials with crystalline and amorphous domains and so forth. And then you can create fibrous and then you can create fibers and so forth. So this is sort of a bottom-up uh, uh, approach, uh, which, where the design really begins at the atomic scale through these chemical interactions. Uh, this is important for uh, if you want to study fibrous uh, for technological applications. Uh, but there are also other areas where this is very relevant to diseases. I'll give one example, and this is uh, what we call amyloid uh, fibrils in, in, uh, in biology. Uh, so in the case of something like Alzheimer's disease, what happens is that uh, we have these chemical interactions and the proteins, and uh, there might be mutations or certain uh, uh, environmental conditions that cause the protein to fold into a different structure. And then once it falls into a different structure, it can uh, quickly aggregate into very stable fibers. And uh, once these fibers are formed, they form uh, plaques. And then the plaques uh, start depositing in tissue, and it's sort of a, a process that uh, basically self-catalyzes itself because you create more binding surfaces 
and there are more particles that attach to them, more proteins, and it just keeps growing uh, indefinitely. And in many cases, the plaque can be almost as large as the organ itself, so it can be quite significant amount of deposition, which disrupts the soft tissue around the material. Uh, so in this sense, uh, there's a lot of things that happen at this scale that we're trying to understand that really governs the formation of these really tough uh, plaque-like structures. Uh, so these are uh, very hard to uh, disintegrate mechanically or uh, enzymatically. So once they form, they form and then there's no way to reverse. So the key to understanding these diseases and how they cause plaques form is really looking at it at a uh, molecular scale and then understanding these uh, higher scale interactions. And then there's other applications of these protein materials. So what, one of the most studied uh, aspects is uh, mechanics of cells, cell mechanics, uh, how cells move around, uh, mechanical transduction or a hierarchy of uh, uh, protein materials uh, within the cell. So you can see we have these hydrogen mold clusters, they create these alpha helices, helices come together, they form these uh, diamond uh, coils. And then uh, basically uh, uh, this uh, goes up in a hierarchical scheme and they have these networks. And then the uh, same issue is for uh, uh, muscle. Muscle is very interesting. If you exercise uh, for a day or you run a marathon or uh, do something very uh, strenuous, uh, then uh, your muscles are aching and everything is torn apart due to both mechanical stress and oxidative stress and, uh, and all of these other things that happen at the molecular scale. Uh, but if you rest for a couple of days, it, you're back to normal. And this is really uh, a very interesting, uh, not only because muscle is active, but I mean, there's all these uh, uh, interesting things that we try to replicate with synthetic materials that give them uh, smart characteristics like muscle, uh, such as electroactivity, uh, changing the chemical environment and changing the contraction. Uh, but there's also uh, the, one of the basic fundamental things that we want to replicate is self eating materials. So if you think of infrastructure and how it degrades and so forth, uh, whether you could make a material that would uh, detect its flaws and then basically correct its flaws. So that's uh, one of the areas where we want to learn as much as we can uh, from biology. And that's a very hard problem. Uh, and then these are general concepts in, in, in proteins and muscle, as well as other proteins also have uh, mechanical functions. So, uh, we can also learn from the mechanical functions that each of these proteins uh, serve. And I'll give one example here uh, that we had the chance to study a little bit. Uh, this is the bacteriophage T4 virus uh, cell puncture device. So this virus basically adheres to the surface of a cell and then it has a certain infection uh, mechanism which is uh, almost purely uh, mechanical in its initiation. So you have this needle which is uh, initiated by molecular motors and uh, it basically drills through the cell wall. The cell wall is uh, very hard to uh, go through because uh, it's, it's, it's strong uh, mechanically and enzymatically can break it down. So you need to drill through it so such that you can uh, inject DNA into the bacteria. Uh, and if you look at the structure of this uh, needle, it's really uh, like, like some of the nanotubes uh, that were discussed in the earlier talks, but it's made up of protein. So it's, it's quite different than uh, the man-made uh, protein uh, structural materials. Um, it's basically a, a structure that is a triangle core and then hydrogen molded domains that stack up on top of each other in a helical uh, shape. And uh, what we observe here is that because it's triangular, it has a lot of stability from a bending rigidity perspective and uh, that basically maximizes the bending rigidity uh, per area. And uh, you can actually do mechanical tests in, in simulations, what is the dynamic simulations, and try to compress and buckle these uh, nanotubes, uh, which actually requires a huge force, so uh, uh, not the level of forces that could be generated by a molecular model. So it, it means that uh, by using the same kind of uh, uh, schemes that we have with structural engineering, such as using triangles and uh, built up columns and these kinds of things. Uh, biology is very successful in creating rigid domains uh, from very weak interactions, hydrogen bonds, for instance. So this is one of the key uh, concepts that we try to also mimic uh, in understanding the protein materials. So the, 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 one of the key messages we take out from this study is that uh, if you look at uh, different kinds of proteins, uh, such as tropicology here, which is basically the uh, tissue, which is mostly intentional, uh, 
you can find that there is the expanding region D, which is typically characterized by persistence length, uh, which is the length at which a <coughs> polymeric chain uh, becomes depolarated, so it's almost like a noodle. Uh, is, is actually uh, quite small in the order of a few nanometers. Whereas if you look at other uh, materials such as uh, the triple beta helices or microtubules, uh, they, they serve other structural functions. They serve usually in compression and uh, that requires a lot of bending rigidity. So uh, even though they have the same kind of chemical interactions, the structural arrangements that, uh, that are formed from self-assembly uh, play a very interesting role here as to generate orders of difference in, in the banding rigidities that we can create. So this is kind of a very interesting concept, even though you have the same chemistry involved, you have uh, basically different, altogether different mechanical properties, which arises from uh, large structural effects. So, um, and these are some of the things that uh, we want to measure both <coughs> experimentally and in computation, and we can actually have direct comparison in the two cases. Experimentally, uh, there's many methods to look at this persistence length. One is a dynamic light scattering, but we can also do mechanical testing. Okay, so uh, one question might be, uh, this is a very interesting area, but when did it really start? When did people uh, want to look at uh, protein mechanics? And uh, I believe that it takes uh, to, to longer times uh, than 1998. But a lot of the breakthroughs happened after 98 because of uh, the technological developments that led to the uh, that increased our capability to study uh, mechanics of protein materials. So uh, these are some of the early studies on uh, mechanics of chitin, which is a, a protein in muscle tissue. It's a huge protein, and uh, what they did was basically stretch it with uh, atomic force microscopy, which is an experimental method to look at uh, the strength of biomolecules and the elasticity of biomolecules. And, uh, and they found that uh, you need basically people need to enable forces to unfold individual domains within a protein. And at the same time, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations that were basically uh, looking at the same kind of problem and trying to understand the molecular mechanisms. So at that time, there was no way to look at how these bonds were breaking and so forth. Now we have a bit more uh, capability of looking at uh, individual mechanisms and experiments, uh, but at the time there was no way to visualize these effects. So uh, it was really nice in the sense that it, it, in around the same years we had basically two methods that complemented each other, and then there was a lot of ideas that transferred from one side uh, to the other. So the, what kind of experimental methods are used at the biomolecular scale? Um, <coughs> As I mentioned, you can do atomic force microscopy. This is a sort of a simple idea where uh, uh, you have a laser and then you have a photo detector and you have a cantilever attached to a, a polymeric material like a, a protein. And then uh, as you move the cantilever, basically you can measure the deflection in the cantilever with the laser and then you can get the force as well as the position. So uh, you get a very nice force displacement curve and uh, you can do analysis on mechanical properties from that. And there's many other ways uh, of really doing the same thing. One is uh, optical tweezers, where you control very small scale beads with uh, a laser, very strong laser. You can stretch uh, uh, red blood cells or uh, individual molecules or DNA and so forth. Um, and there's also things like magnetic tweezers. So you could essentially rotate a, a magnetic tweezer in a, in a field, and then uh, you can look at the uh, torsion tests and all, all kinds of other things uh, using these approaches. So, there are many different experimental methods and then equivalently we have all these complementary methods in simulation where you try to make a comparison uh, between the two. Uh, so experiments can validate simulation, but also simulations can direct experiments and explain a lot of uh, different mechanisms uh, that, that wouldn't be predicted easily with the experiment. Okay, so uh, the two approaches that are typically taken in simulation and experiment are, are fairly similar. Uh, in terms of schematic description. So let's say you have a biomolecule, you can stretch it with uh, atomic force microscopy. This is in vitro. And then in computers, which we call in silico, uh, you do the same thing. You basically apply a spring and then you move the spring with a, a constant velocity. And then you can look at the unfolding uh, forces. And then you can compare the two curves uh, in the two cases. So many people have looked at the, the unfolding uh, processes in, in proteins because it's very important uh, from a biophysics perspective 
and also important from a biomechanics perspective when you look at larger scales. One of the key things that we recognize uh, in these materials is the, the presence of what we call entropic elasticity. So I'm wondering how many of you have heard about this term entropic elasticity? Okay, so a few. So maybe I will go into a little bit of detail as to explain what this really means. Uh, and similar to what we know as a mechanical elasticity, but uh, the mechanisms are, are, are quite different. So to, to talk about entropic elasticity, we first need to talk a little bit about entropy, the definition of entropy. And uh, I think the easiest system to think about really there is a diffusion of, uh, of gas in, in, a, in a container. And uh, let's say you have a semi-permeable membrane and gas on one side and an empty space on the other side. And uh, if you look at it probabilistically, there's only one way, if you think of this uh, simple lattice system, there's only one way this system can occur. You have everything here and everything there, and there's no shuttling uh, uh, possible. Uh, if, if one of the particles moves to the other side, then you have basically more uh, ways of uh, creating the system from the anterior. Uh, so this particle, the, this empty spot could be in four different places, and this particle could be in four, in four different places. So you have basically 16 different ways you can have this system. And then when you come to the uh, uh, point where it's in equilibrium, basically the two particles here and two particles there, uh, you basically uh, maximize what you call multiplicity. So the number of uh, configurations that have the same characteristic uh, uh, available to that state, that macroscopic state. So this relates very much to what I talked about ensembles in the past uh, lecture. Uh, and then we said the uh, system typically tends toward minimum energy, but if you look at this picture, now we can also say that system tends towards maximum multiplicity. So in other words, when you open the door and enter a room, it's very unlikely that you'll find all of the gas molecules in one corner. It's usually stirred up. And that's the basis of this uh, simple thermodynamical concept. So entropy is, uh, in this sense, related to multiplicity by uh, basically a, a simple formula. So why is this important? It basically governs the mechanics of uh, polymeric chains at, at, at small force levels. So if you think of a biomolecule such as DNA, you can think of it as a linear chain connected by strings. This is a, a simplification, but let's, let's go with it for now. And then as a starting point, you can talk about uh, the mechanics of a single chain uh, under an applied force. So you could start off with the simplest model. Each monomer is a, a spring. And uh, there's no bending energy penalty, so they can basically rotate however they like. And uh, this is called uh, the free, freely jointed chain uh, model. It's a very simple model. And uh, if you take the points in between uh, the, 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 the beads uh, as very small, you can even think of them as, as rigid. So in that case, the polymer chain is then considered as a random walk. So you have random rigid vectors, each with the same length for simplicity. And if the length be short, this is a, basically a rigid, like a chromatic form, the form of the, the, the molecular system. Okay, so uh, after that, there are two measures of the size of the molecule. So one is the counter length, which is basically n times b. So uh, if you were to trace this whole uh, vector, uh, this is basically what it would be. And then the, the other is the actual end-to-end -end length. So starting from here, and basically looking at where you end up. And that's uh, different from the counter length uh, for the chain when it's in a collapsed state. Uh, and this is basically the simple vector summation. Uh, if, if the links are rigid, then uh, basically the end-to-end -end length has to be always less than the counter length, obviously. And uh, the counter length, of course, is related to, to the molecular weight or molecular size of the system. And, uh, once you do this, you can break it down into components, so x component, y component, and z component, as vector summations. And then, uh, since uh, the freely jointed chain is more like a, a random walk, so you can go in many different directions, uh, in the end, the, the red distance we cover is uh, equal to zero. So you can't really get a very useful relation if you just look at the sum of vectors. Uh, what we usually do, and this is the same thing we do in diffusion, uh, is basically look at the mean square as a useful parameter for distance characterization. So if you look at a, a molecular dynamic simulation of a fluid, you can basically get the diffusion constant by looking at the mean square displacement. And it's a very simple relation. Uh, same thing here, uh, we can basically look at the mean square and sum over all of the terms, uh, just the self terms in this case, because the other terms are the dark product is zero, 
And I want to observe is a very general rule that tells us that mu square radius of a uh, polynomial is an uh, increase in proportion to the square root of that in, in a later way. And this is generally true even when you have angle correlations or factors which should be uh, taken into account. So then uh, we can calculate the average uh, positions, uh, average uh, values for the end and length. How about the probability of, uh, of distribution of this system? Uh, in the simplest sense, uh, this is usually approximated by a Gaussian distribution, which leads to this probability uh, distribution, uh, where you have the most likely configuration at uh, zero point, and then uh, uh, moves positive or negative are typically equal like it's not the change of flow in either direction. And then once you have that, you basically have everything you need to describe what we call entropic analysis. So the idea here is that if you have this kind of a chain, and then if you want to pull it, uh, what is the, uh, the resisting force when you have a certain extension? So what would be the equivalent uh, spring constant in that sense uh, that would give you this entropic uh, reason? The question there is, okay, why is it entropic? Uh, the reason here is uh, uh, if you basically you have no bond stretching. So you have a very small force that uh, reconfigures the protein. And uh, if you look at the free energy of the system, uh, you don't have an internal energy change, but you have basically a change in entropy. Uh, this is because uh, a chain that has collapsed has more states accessible to it than a chain which is completely extended, which has only one state available to it. So, simple as that. Uh, so, and then you can look at multiplicity again, and you know the probability distribution of different states as a function of extension. And from that, you can uh, basically derive uh, the equation for the free energy. And then once we have that, uh, all we have to do is basically take the free energy, the derivative of with respect to S. The x, which gives you the refractive force in, in a polymeric chain. Um, and uh, here, you observe that there is basically a linear relation with respect to this. It's almost like a regular spring constant. And uh, this is what we call an entropic spring constant. And uh, it's essentially like a Hookian spring that you can use. But the limitation here is that we assume the Gaussian distribution initially for the entire net. And this is, this might be okay for small deformation, but in large deformation, it doesn't hold very well. Still, the idea is useful in understanding how this entropic effect, just looking at the free energy change, can uh, give rise to a retractive force. So basically, if you try to hold the chain in an extended state, it will always apply a force to, to go back to its collapse state. So, uh, this is a very simple model, and we have many assumptions. And one of the key assumptions we have that, that the chain has no bending rigidity. But for things like DNA and other biomolecules, there's actually some bending rigidity associated with the molecule. And uh, a more commonly used model for this aspect is what we call the one like chain model. So in this case, uh, you basically say that the angular correlation of the, of the this, uh, vectors that we have uh, 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 decays exponentially. So when, the, when there are two vectors that are close to each other, uh, they are more correlated with each other. Now, as a vector that is far away, eventually has no correlation as to the initial direction that we start to plot. Now, if you do that assumption and derive a continuum theory for bending uh, rigidity and so forth, uh, you get another kind of uh, nonlinear relation that basically gives you uh, the entropic coiling force. And uh, one interesting thing is that the persistence length can be directly related to the bending rigidity. So, simple EI from continuum mechanics. Uh, if you could measure it, then that would be uh, related to the persistence length uh, I mentioned earlier. <coughs> so this is the basis of uh, a lot of mechanical stretching tests that were done uh, in the past. And uh, when we stretch it with either AFM and, uh, or optical trap, we could basically uh, fit uh, these equations uh, of, of Warnike chain to the actual observations we have. And uh, essentially, you can observe that there's a very nonlinear uh, kind of behavior. It's almost like a spaghetti kind of uh, uh, behavior. When the spaghetti is, uh, is uh, cold, it's very rigid, but when, you, when it's hot, it's, it's like a noodle, and uh, there's a dependence on temperature, as well as expansion that really describes this uh, kind of behavior. I think this, uh, this study was probably for collagen, which is uh, most of the connective tissue, 30%. Um, okay, so uh, we, we observe this uh, shape, and then we also have these uh, uh, several domains that are usually uh, one after another in the protein. 
uh, what you observe there is this sawtooth shaped uh, force extension curves. Uh, and uh, there's, there's some nonlinear parts that we had uh, approximated from one my chain model. And you can actually predict the unfolding force uh, over each of these domains. Uh, but the question there is uh, is this adequate as a description for the overall uh, behavior of the protein? Well, if you take a really close look to, to some of these curves, uh, which in, in the earlier studies there was a really no one who looked at it very closely, but uh, more after after a while people started looking at this. Uh, what you can uh, what you can observe is there's some deviations from what you would consider a, a typical one line chain behavior. And uh, what what you, in most cases you observe is basically you have a one line chain behavior, and all of a sudden you have a jump to another kind of curve, and then uh, this is within uh, one curve that looks like a single one line chain. Curve. There's some intricacies there. And if you look at the, the most widely studied proteins, such as I27, uh, you can actually clearly see a difference uh, of, of several uh, angstroms or nanometers in these cases. Um, and then uh, the key idea here is that uh, a lot of these chain models are idealized. Right? We didn't talk any, uh, about uh, anything like self interactions, how the chain would bind to itself, and so forth. Uh, so these are. Effects such as hydrogen bonds are typically uh, not considered in the, in, the, in the theory. So one idea would be how can we create a model that basically looks at uh, this breaking of the uh, weaker interactions in pursuit of sort of more general <coughs> law. So this is something we did uh, with regards to strength uh, of protein materials. Now we started off with uh, two simple parameters. The basic idea is to seek a simple yet predictive strength model for simple geometries uh, pertaining to protein materials. And the idea is basically you have two parameters. One is the strength of the hydrogen bonds, uh, which basically represents all of the interactions. And then the other is the persistence strength, which relates to the, the stiffness of the molecular chains. And then what we what we did was essentially bring the concept from uh, fracture mechanics, which is the energy Dallas concept uh, developed by Griffith and Erwin. And uh, where we say that the free energy chain of the entropic uh, chains is equal to the dissociation energy of the hydrogen bond. So as you stretch it, if you have an equivalence uh, where uh, the stretching, work done by the stretching will cause a rupture of the bonds. And then uh, when you look at this kind of a relation, uh, you have several parameters, the persistence length, the energy of the interactions, which you can roughly estimate as 4 kilocalories or more. Uh, and then basically persistence length, as I mentioned, uh, and that basically and then uh, you can basically write again the free energy state function uh, and then uh, basically this is derived from the one like chain model and then uh, you can essentially write the energy balance and then you can take the derivative with respect to the propagation of this uh, tack like uh, uh, behavior and then once you do that you get a critical condition at which when you have a static force applied to the system uh, when the, the, the rupture event is going to occur and uh, this is basically for a large cluster of bonds uh, uh, in the domain, so it's not a very small cluster. Uh, and then what you observe is, is the following behavior, just like in the experimental case, you can have basically a stretching and then a jump to the other curve, which would be used in the map, and then you have basically a relaxation at the end of the unlawful scenario. Uh, so a lot of the theories that, that exist for proteins either looks at the elasticity or the strength. So for the strength, one of the most commonly used uh, methods is, uh, is the Bell model, which is uh, basically a, a probabilistic model that uh, uses the Arrhenius simulation and an uh, application of a force uh, basically reduces or tilts the energy landscape uh, such that you can work on the system and it's easier to jump from uh, one state to another state. And uh, if you look at the uh, Bell type relations, and uh, if you think of it very simplistically as the more bonds you have, the more strength you're going to get, uh, you would predict that it, it, it's going to keep increasing as you add more and more bonds. But when you think of the fracture criteria that I talked about earlier, you would think of that uh, if you try to uh, the field, uh, the molecular system, uh, when you have an infinitely long uh, uh, tape as opposed to a short tape, there should be a point at which uh, you don't have this uh, Basically, bonds that are far away from the tape don't really sense what's going on at the frontier of uh, that. So, what you observe from that is uh, basically uh, a formula that gives you a, a threshold for maximum strength you can achieve uh, with a cluster of hydrogen bonds. And uh, uh, 
uh, you can predict the number of hydrogen bonds and you can predict where that transition is going to occur. Yeah, so then th that number is quite small. Right? What is that exact transition number? Sounds so, like four, three or four? Yeah, three or four. It okay. depends on the solvent environment and how exposed the hydrogen bonds are. And uh, in this simple model, I think the, the parameter that governs that is uh, EB. So as EB is, uh, is, is uh, smaller, uh, you have more cooperative and weaker bonds, typical cooperative. But if you have a very strong bond, then they tend to break more. And more. So the basic idea is that okay, if you have a convergence towards uh, this uh, constant value that uh, point. And uh, this has some implications on, on protein domains that we observe. Uh, if the number is really small, as we said, like uh, something like four, uh, then what you observe is that if you normalize it by the length, it will almost have a shape like this, where you really have a optimum length scale at which you have the maximum shear strength. And this is similar to inverse Alpesh type behavior, where if it's too small, then uh, the bonds are very weak, but if it's too long, you're not really using all of the strength. Uh, of course, this is a completely different mechanism, and I'm not going to check or repair at least the uh, So, why is this important? Uh, there's interesting uh, applications of it, I'll just mention one here. Uh, if you look at a lot of these uh, hydrogen bonded protein domains, uh, in many cases, they are actually very small domains. So, there's usually three or four, uh, maybe at most five bonds that, uh, that create. Uh, these uh, clusters of hydrogen bonds. Uh, so what we think is the case is that uh, these are universally confined topologies that really generate the maximum strength uh, out of these hydrogen molecular domains. Uh, so this is actually, there were some recent studies that looked at how you could create uh, biomimetic materials that also have these hydrogen molecular domains. Uh, uh, and uh, basically inspired from hydrogen and all of these materials. And there they also observed that if you had more than four bonds uh, typically have a reduction in strength, so it seems to be correlated with a lot of the more recent studies. So this is sort of what I had as most of the theoretical things, but of course all of these models are very simplistic. I mean, we only consider the case where we have a parallel arrangement of bonds, but if you look at an actual protein, there's all these complicated topologies and different domains and so forth. So the key idea is, here is basically, can we use molecular dynamics as a tool to do uh, to science and to understand proteins uh, in, in, in more depth. Uh, so I'm going to talk more about the computational methods uh, that are theory in the next uh, few hours of this, this lecture and the next two lectures. And most of the methods I will talk about is uh, molecular dynamics and coarse grain simulation. So these are different from quantum mechanical calculations and the larger scale calculations such as finite element methods. But these are not completely unrelated to each other. I mean, there's many methods uh, to train molecular dynamics from quantum mechanics or cross strain models from molecular dynamics and also finite elements from uh, cross strain simulations and so forth. And it doesn't have to be uh, linear, so you don't have to go from one stage to the other to the other to the other. And there's many ways where you can map directly from quantum uh, to finite element simulations. So it's not just this uh, uh, simplified linear scheme of uh, things. The other thing is, I mean, you might still have quantum effects at the continuum level. It's not like uh, quantum is only existing at the angstrom scale. It's, it's a general phenomenon that, that uh, can be treated at different length scales. So the, the specific to molecular dynamics, uh, we're talking about a computational approach where we're looking at particle systems of particles. So, and then we're solving this uh, Newton's equations uh, as a function of time. And uh, basically what we're doing is, uh, we have different kinds of terms, so you might have bond stretching, uh, you might have angles, so you have the <coughs> bending rigidity of the particles. And then you can also have electrostatic interactions, kind of long-range interactions that uh, uh, change the dynamics of the system. Um, you can have uh, Van der Waals interactions, weak uh, dispersive interactions. And you can also have rotations and uh, different kinds of torsion uh, interactions. And all of these interactions are defined by what we call uh, interatomic potentials. So, uh, for proteins, for instance, one of the most commonly used potentials is, is called charm, which was brought at uh, Harvard uh, uh, in the 80s, I think, early 80s, and uh, has been updated for 30 years. And uh, the parameters are typically universal and entirely based on the chemistry of the atom. So, this is either derived from uh, first principles, so quantum mechanical calculations, or, or experiments. Uh, but when I say universal, what I mean is uh, uh, 
uh, a potential for proteins is applicable to generally to many different proteins, but uh, you can apply you can't apply the same uh, potential to let's say carbon nanotubes very easily. You can make it for small deformation, but uh, typically uh, <coughs> differences in force residual applications. So the key concept here is that uh, a lot of the structures we observe really uh, come from uh, chemical interactions. So the basis of uh, covalent bonds and statins and hydrogen bonds, that involves the collection of this whole uh, spectra of interactions really gives rise to this complicated structure that we try to understand a bit more. Okay, so the idea we have is then uh, we can split the energy contributions from each of these interactions which gives you a total uh, energy of the system. And uh, you can basically simplify things quite a bit here. And you can say yeah, the ethane molecule is, a, is basically an elastic structure, just like in uh, continuum mechanics, the way we do things. Uh, and then you can have a bond stretching part, uh, energy penalty, and a dangling part, and a rotation part, and so forth. And then you can sum up these terms, and then basically get the total energy. Uh, so for the specific case of charm, which is is a nice example because it has a comprehensive range of uh, parameters. Uh, you, you have many different uh, terms. So you have uh, bonds and then uh, Bradley and then uh, angle terms, uh, dihedrals, improperties, and non-bonded interactions. So you have to superpose all of these different interactions such that you get an overall uh, correct structure and vibration properties. And uh, this typically all these parameters are trained or optimized from experiment. So you can do a and how to get experiments or look at small molecules, how they vibrate, and then basically get that information into uh, sort of this empirical description of the everything. And if you look at the details, uh, basically uh, these dihedrals and uh, improperties and angles and bonds all pertain to certain kind of uh, chemical uh, systems or chemical arrangements of uh, interactions. So connectivity is essential. Bonds are simple, it's just a spring that connects to the atoms. Angles are, are related to these kind of motions. We have an angle between three atoms. And then dihedral and improperties are more related to four atoms. So uh, let's say you have three atoms in a plane, that you find a plane, and then a fourth atom that basically doesn't like to be on that plane. That's how we describe these portion of the And then you have these long range interactions such as charges and then those interactions. And there was a question yesterday about solvation, I think, and uh, this is one of the key issues here, that, that in many cases you want to have the same physiological solvent and, uh, as, as you would have in, in, in experiments, uh, which means you might have ions and water surrounding it, typically a pH 7, it could be a different pH as well. And then uh, you basically solvate the molecule in the periodic box, so in this specific case I have initially 44 atoms, now with solvent I have a thousand atoms, and unfortunately much slower. But if you do need explicit solvent in many cases because uh, there are hydrogen bonding effects, there are water bridges, there's charge screening, uh, hydrophobic forces, uh, fluid viscosity, and entropy of the fluid when you stretch a molecule, for instance. So uh, all of these have to be taken into account somehow. And that basically relates to a large computation of time. So we mentioned all of these nice things about uh, molecular dynamics and uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, uh, weaknesses and uh, this, this can be expanded, but it's just quickly we can go over this. I think uh, the strength of MD is that we can get atomic resolution, we can get details of rupture mechanisms, bone ruptures, etc. Uh, if you get the full trajectories, you can also obtain free energies or solvation energies and these kind of things. Uh, you get dynamics, thermal conductivity, mechanical, etc. Uh, and it doesn't cost anything. You just pay for the electricity and maybe the cost of the software, but a lot of the software we use is, is basically free. Uh, the weaknesses, of course, is the uh, limitations in night scales, time scales. <coughs> in many cases, uh, you can't uh, update the uh, connectivity. So if you have a covalent bond at the beginning of a simulation, it's not broken. So if you want to consider that, you need what we call a reactive formulation, so taking into account chemical reactions. Uh, you typically have an initial condition dependent, so if you start from one scenario, you might end up in one trajectory. If you start from another scenario, you end up in another trajectory. So I have to average all, the, all of these effects. And uh, dependence on the geometry and force field, etc., as well as access to the supercomputer. So 
and you can extend this list, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's adequate to show the effect. Um, but there's a lot of exciting applications where Moiko Dynamics really gave us a lot of insight. And I mentioned this application uh, yesterday, I believe, it's called Holding at Home, where you use distributed computing resources such as uh, cell phones or uh, uh, PlayStation or that are distributed across the world. And by using simple things such as a screen saver, you can use, you can tap into this endless resource of computation and use it to do, uh, let's say, protein coding or study diseases or many other things. So, uh, there are a lot of different applications where uh, you can use these simple calculations and uh, get very nice results. Uh, we're mostly interested in mechanics, so uh, some of the things we want to look at is uh, uh, something like the stretching of a protein in muscle and uh, uh, observe what kind of bond breaking mechanism.